Happy Sabbath, brethren, and welcome to today's Sabbath services. Good to see you all. A little low in number. Now, today was supposed to be our social, but um, obviously the trains have killed that off, so we plan to have that next week. We're also planning a church outing, uh, sort of middle to latter part of July, to Windsor Castle, and then maybe get on a boat down the River Thames. So, um, yeah, so. Keep, you know, keep your eye out for the, the announcement on that and the, uh, the little flyer that we'll put out. Okay, well good to see you all. Hope you've all had a good week. And uh, now we have an opportunity to sing. So if you'd like to take your hymnal, turn to page 84, I am resolved. If you found that, if you could all rise, please. 84, I am resolved. Thank you. 
We give you thanks and praise for bringing us safely through the week and safely to services today. Father, there are a few people missing today because of the trains and other problems. Please be with them, comfort them and guide them. Father, we thank you for this day and what it actually means to us. It's a, it's a wonderful day. Father, we ask you to praise the message that we've got today. Um, hit open our ears that we may hear what's been said and inspire the reading as well, Father. So, Father, we thank you very much once again and we put all these things into your loving care in and through the name of your Son, our Saviour, Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Okay, please be seated. I'd like to call Brother Phil up for the opening scripture, which I forgot to do in the last place. I must I knew I'd do that, but uh, it's a reading from Proverbs chapter 2, verses 1 to 8. My son, if you accept my words and treasure my commands with you so that you make your ear attend to wisdom, incline your heart to understanding. For if you cry for discernment, lift up your voice for understanding. If you seek her as silver and search for her as hidden treasures, then you will understand the fear of Yahweh and find the knowledge of Elohim. For Yahweh gives wisdom, out of his mouth come knowledge and understanding, and he treasures up stability for the straight a shield to those walking blamelessly, to watch over the paths of God's glory and the way of his lovely committed ones in God. Amen. Thank you, Brother Phil, for the scripture reading. We don't have any special music today, so we'll carry on with our next hymn, which is hymn number 20, Standing on the promises of God. When you found that, if you could all rise, please. In 20, standing on the promises of God. Yeah. 
like to invite Sister Lola up for the second scripture reading, which is taken from Acts, chapter 9, verses 10 to 15. there was a disciple named Ananias. The Lord called him in a vision, Ananias. Yes, Lord, he answered. The Lord told him, go to the house of Judas on Straight Street and ask for a man from Tarus named Saul, for he is praying. In the vision, he has seen a man named Ananias come and place his hands on him to restore his sight. Lord, Ananias answered, I have heard many reports about this man and all the harm he has done to your holy people in Jerusalem and he has come here with authority from the chief priests to arrest all who call on your name. Verse 15, But the Lord said to Ananias, Go, this man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and their kings and the people of Israel. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. Thank you, Sister Lola, for the scripture reading. And now we have the main sermon by Pastor Gary, entitled Value the Foot Fellowship. Good afternoon, brethren, and a very warm welcome to uh, our special guest. <laughs> they happen every week, actually. <laughs> and a very warm welcome to those who, for obvious reasons, can't be here because of the train strike. So I hope uh, some of our brethren are able to view us live. So, brethren, today I would like to to talk about a subject that I believe given the times that we are living in, will take on more and more importance and more significance for the Church of God as the tide turns ever more <coughs> against the Word of God. The subject matter I would like to address today is something that we're all very well aware of. It's a subject that, in, in a manner of speaking, carries on in the same vein uh, to the last two messages we've had. Last Sabbath, Pastor George talked about how God grows his church. He showed that there were certain elements in the church prior to a burst of growth. The church was right with God, and the church was right with each other. And the word of God was being spread, and there was fruit born. 3,000 people were added says one scripture. Another scripture says 5,000 were added. And as time went on, it appears the number got so big, it was just easier to say there were multitudes added. Such were the numbers added to the flock. Numerically, the church was on the up. And the week before, I looked at the, the fact that between the end of Pentecost, or Pentecost and Trumpets, there's about four months four months of uh, where we are asked the question, where would our focus be in, the, in those four months? After all, we've just come out of an intense period of Passover. We had the wave chief day, the days of unleavened bread. We observed the feast of week. There was always something 
for those weeks that we were focusing on day by day, week by week. And as such, as Christians, we had much to do and much to be mindful of. So today, I would like to look at a subject that sort of dovetails nicely with both of those messages. It's certainly one of the ingredients that existed within the early church as it grew numerically. And it's also a byproduct, if you will, that comes as a result of ongoing Christian development. And my purpose today, brethren, is to show the value of it. And I want us to have an understanding that we shall all be encouraged to see its ever-increasing value that it plays in, this, in the world of a congregation and what it plays in, the day, in our daily lives. See the value of it as we are led by God's Holy Spirit to participate in it. And I'll look at, at the end of the message, I'll be looking at the dangers of neglecting it. What is it that I'm talking about? Mm -hmm. Fellowship. I'd like us to understand, brethren, the value of fellowship. Now, the reason for this message today was because we were going to have a social, as you know. And I thought, well, that kind of fitting quite nicely as well. Um, but the actual tone of, of the message has taken a different, different sort of uh, direction as I was putting it together, as I realised we weren't having a social. I thought, well, I came to the same subject matter and bring in maybe what you might call certain other elements that are still very applicable to fellowship, but maybe look at things from a different angle. But I believe fellowship is a tool. It's something active, it's alive, or should be alive, and it's a tool that we need to keep sharp. It's a tool that we need to be making the most of. So one might say, well, don't we fellowship every week? Which the answer is undoubtedly yes. Of course we fellowship every week here at church. Well, that's a good start. That's a good start. But as, by way of use, brethren, and let us say, lack of maintenance, could our fellowship become dull? Or to use a physical, a physical analogy, could our fellowship become blunt? There's just nothing there. Now, before I go further, I believe we're here in this little flock. I think we're doing a sterling job. We're doing a sterling job of keeping the tool of fellowship uh, sharp. In the great scheme of things, I think we're doing a pretty good job. Room for improvement? <laughs> of course, undoubtedly. But nonetheless, on the whole, given the dynamics that, that are at play, the environment that we all live in, the, the demographics, we're all faring pretty well, I think. We strive to be alive in this flock. For those who might want to come and join us, we are a church that seeks to be alive. We are engaged in discussion. And pretty much for the most part, I would say everybody, in one way, shape or form, contributes to this body. That's the good news. That's a good report, I think. The bad news is, the hunter, the adversary, the arch enemy, and his band of very unmerry men seek to destroy us. Thus, the need, really, brethren, for this reminder. So, for this message, brethren, by way of reminder, as I said, I want us to, well, I want to demonstrate, actually, the value and the need for fellowship, along with illustrating the importance that each of us bring something to this body of Christ. Encourage us to carry on bringing something, develop the gifts that God's given each and every one of us. And again, as I said, finally, we should look, we should look at the danger, the very real danger, brethren, of neglecting fellowship. So let's look at the value of fellowship. So fellowship, in essence, it means that people come together, they socialise, they are bound together because, in essence, they've got something in common. But for some, because of their natural disposition, and fellowshipping can be an effort. 
We're all different and fellowshipping can be an effort. Indeed, certain life experiences that have shaped your character may also play a part in being reluctant to naturally fellowship. And again, for the church, I believe, brethren, that is something that we need to be aware of. Now, on the flip side, some are very social. And fellowshipping is the most natural thing in the world for them, which is great. But a word of warning, brethren, a word of warning. And that is, yes, I am here to encourage fellowship, and I am here for, to demonstrate us to see the value of it. But let us not take it for granted, brethren. Let us not, as a church, misuse or misunderstand what it means to fellowship when we come together as a body of Christ. So why do I say this, brethren? Why do I say, let us not misuse or misunderstand? Well, like anything, brethren, anything that we do, whatever it may be, the more we do something, the more kind of comfortable we can be with things. And dare I say it, brethren, the more that we fellowship, if we don't understand fellowship, if we misuse fellowship, we are fellowshipping, but we are complacent in our fellowship because we may have gone a bit dull or blunt. Let me explain. A few moments ago, I asked, could our fellowship, by way of use and lack of maintenance, could it become dull? Could it become blunt? And the reason I say that is because this week at work, I was working on, as for those of you who don't know, I work in a, in a maintenance department. And I was working on a, on a door frame. And I had to get you know, some tools out, of which mine was a chisel. Now, the chisels I've got, are good quality tools. They're very good quality tools. The makeup of them, you know, the, the way they, they feel, the steel on, on them, it's all excellent. They're made to last. Your yeah, brethren, by way of use, by way of use, by way of using them over and over again, the very thing that they're designed for, which is chiseling wood, over a period of time, they go blunt. They lose that sharpness. They lose that sharpness, which is essential if they have to do their job properly. So rather than cutting through nice and sharp, it ends up pretty much chewing through the wood. So you need to keep that chisel sharp. Now in case some of you don't know, when you sharpen a chisel, you use a sharpening stone and oil. And the spiritual connections, brethren, for this illustration, it shouldn't be lost on us. Stone, oil, and chisel. Stone, oil, and chisel. The chisel represents our fellowship. It's rubbed against the stone or the solid rock of Jesus Christ in order to sharpen it. Yet, prior to any of that, we pour oil on the stone. And as we know, oil is symbolic of the Holy Spirit. In other words, brethren, to sharpen that chisel properly, all the elements need to be in place. The stone and the oil. Therefore, in order for us to maintain that sharpness of fellowship, brethren, certain elements need to be in place. God the Father and Son Jesus Christ need to be here among us. And may I say, central to everything we do. Central to everything we do. All the proceedings and the agape love that flows from his Holy Spirit has got to be active. You now, if, if God the Father and Jesus Christ, if they're not the focus, if they're not the focus of this assembly, if they are not at their very heart, the epicenter, if you will, of all that we do, we run the risk, brethren, of being a social club. For emphasis, we are not a social club. But the threat is always there. 
Why? Because Satan will always seek that opportunity. Now, in many social clubs, you're going to get little cliques, aren't you? We're all familiar with that. And that's where it's flesh and blood here in this body of Christ. We're going to gravitate to other people more than others, just as that's the way we are. In other words, brethren, if you are a foot within this body, you're going to gravitate more to others who are likewise feet within the body of Christ. Because naturally you're going to have more in common with them. On the other hand, pardon the pun, as we shall see, the hand and the foot must be connected to be considered part of the body. Yet the foot won't naturally gravitate towards the hand. Let's turn to 1 Corinthians 12, the very familiar scripture where it goes through the list of body parts in relation to the, to the church. First Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 12. It says, For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For in one spirit we were all baptised into one body, Jew or Greek, slave or free, and we were all made to drink of one spirit. For the body does not consist of one member, but many. If the foot should say to the hand, or if the foot should say, I should say, because I am not a hand, <laughs> I don't belong to the body, that wouldn't make it any less part of the body. You can say what you like, but it's still part of the body. And if the ear should say, well, because I'm not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would be the sense of smell? But as it is, God has arranged the members in the body, each one of them, as he chose. If all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, yet one body. Verse 21, the eye cannot say to the hand, the eye, the seeing eye, cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. It cannot say that. Nor again the head to the feet. I have no need of you. Verse 22. On the contrary, the parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And on those parts of the body that we think less honourable, we bestow the greater honour. And our unpresentable parts are treated with greater modesty. Which our more presentable parts do not require. But God has so composed the body, giving greater honour to the part that lacked it. Verse 25, that there may be no division in the body, but that the members have the same care one for another. A lengthy passage of scripture, brethren. But we see there, we go through that bit by bit and dissect it even more. We will see that a healthy fellowship, brethren, is the result of a connected body. A healthy body requires, it's not like an assumption or maybe, a healthy body requires that all parts function as they are able and as they have been placed in it. You cannot say, as we just read, okay, I'm a foot, I'm not a hand. So if I'm not a hand, I'm not a part of the body. You can't say that. You can't say that you're not part of this fellowship because God has placed you where he sees fit. No, no, if, if you act like a foot, act like a foot. But if you're a head, recognise that the foot is essential to the body. It's this interaction and understanding that we all play a part. Have the same care one for another, fellowship and work together as one. A body brethren that is connected by the way of the Holy Spirit and connected by an understanding, this body, we are placed in it, as, as I said, as God sees fit and he has placed you within it to do a job for the body. 
In Ephesians chapter 4, again a, a lengthy passage of scripture, but invaluable nonetheless. Verse 11, he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Verse 14, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness in deceitful schemes. Rather speaking the truth in love, brethren, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head. In other words, into Christ. From whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. Brethren, here we see that the, one of the benefits of fellowship, assembling of ourselves together, is that we can all be taught in order to be equipped for ministry. All of us are to be equipped through the Word of God for ministry. As we've heard before over the years, the church is a training ground. We come here to be trained in the Word of God. And as we discuss the message in our round table session afterwards, that fellowship is like a spiritual debrief, in a manner of speaking, with God the Father and His Son Jesus Christ at the heart of the discussion. It has to be. Iron sharpening iron, as we know. And by adding to the, to the discussion, if you are an I, you add things that God may have given you the wisdom to see in order that others may benefit. Everybody playing a part. That's where we encourage everybody to, to come along, fellowship, and have some input. Because we're all here to equip each other through the Word of God for ministry. Not just from here. We all have something to offer. You know, fellowship brethren at church on the Sabbath, if used effectively, it enables us to have all the tools that we need. And if used effectively, it will stop us being tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine. We won't be enticed away from the flock by that niggling twig or that pesky stone in the shoe. They irritate you and, and you start looking more at the, at the stone in the shoe or the twig at the end of the tree rather than sticking to the trunk. We won't be doing that. We grow as we learn. We move away, as someone once said to me, we move away from P1. We move away from infant school. We put on our big boy pants, so to speak, and we look to graduate to the stature of Jesus Christ. Who is God? And God is love. Love has to be at the heart of this fellowship. Outcoming concern for others. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1, Paul said that he was a prisoner of the Lord and he urges us that you walk worthily of the vocation with which you are called. With all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another, in love, endeavouring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. And he reminds us again, there is one body and one Spirit, even as you are called in one hope or one expectation of your calling. For through him we have access by one Spirit unto the Father. Now therefore, says Paul, you are no more strangers and foreigners, but your fellow citizens of the saints and of the household of God. And you are built upon the foundation. You're built upon the solid rock. You're built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, 
Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. In whom, this body, brethren, in whom all the building, this temple, in Jesus Christ, in whom all the building fitly framed together grows unto a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you are also building together for a habitation of God through the Spirit. Brethren, Jesus Christ did not die in order that the ones who are called out of the world, who have been given eyes to see, and if you're near, that you have ears to hear, he didn't die so that they would form a nice, cosy social club. He didn't die for that reason. He didn't die in order that all the spiritual feet would congregate exclusively at the back and all the eyes would be over here. He didn't die for that reason either, brethren. He's not prepared to allow the toes and elbows never to be mixing together. The body has got to be connected. He didn't order, I beg your pardon, he didn't die in order that if you are an arm, that you willfully disconnect yourself from the body. Maybe you have some sort of grievance or irritation that you may or may not have encountered. But for whatever reason, you feel that you need to disconnect yourself from the body. Disconnecting yourself from the body, brethren, is like being amputated. And an, an amputated limb or part of the body is sadly of no use to anybody. Jesus Christ, brethren, died in order that every man, everywhere, may have the opportunity of being saved at their appointed time. And for those of us, brethren, assembled here today, his death meant that if we just read in Ephesians, that if we have been called, we have got to understand the value of that calling and walk in a worthy manner. And fellowship plays a part of that. Fellowship plays a part of that, brethren. Fitly framed together, as Ephesians says. Fitly framed together. Fitly fellowshipping together. Not disjointed. Togetherness. And togetherness, brethren, is important to God. Togetherness is important to God. It's important to the fellowship. Let's look at Malachi chapter 3. And verse 16. Malachi 3 verse 16, the first few words it says, Then they that feared the Lord, then they that feared the Lord. And we'll just stop just there. Because in the context of the previous verses, then they that feared the Lord would read, because of, or as a result of, what they just heard. They feared the Lord. <coughs> They've just been, you look back from verse 1 to 15. They heard something. And because of that, then they that feared the Lord listened. They feared the Lord. They had reverence and godly fear. Then they that feared the Lord spoke often one to another. And the Lord listened and heard it. And a book of remembrance was written before him for them that fear the Lord and have thought upon his name. In verse 17 it says, And they shall be mine. Those that fear the Lord, those that because of what they heard, those as a result of what they heard, who spoke often one to another, they shall be mine, says the Lord, when I make up my jewels, and I will spare them as a man spares his own son that serves him. So in Malachi, brethren, we see that those, that is by Israel, and by extension us, those who feared the Lord, they had great reverence for him, they spoke often one to another. And I believe, brethren, that is an example for us today. We, who say that we be called out of the world, we who lead such busy lives, we run the risk, brethren, we run the danger of not making time for one another. So Malachi, like all scripture, has been left for us for correction, 
for reproof and for instruction in righteousness. So let's personalise Malachi 3. So if we personalise where it says that because of or as a result of God opening your mind, it would read something like this. As a result of God opening their minds, the church of God at Radley, they who call themselves spiritual Israel, because of this, they feared the Lord. And they spoke often one to another. And the Lord listened and heard it, and a book of remembrance was written before him for them that fear the Lord and those that thought upon his name. The church of God at Bradley spoke often one to another, i.e. not just on the Sabbath. They spoke often one to another. And when we're not just speaking with each other on the Sabbath, we put into practice a condition that existed in the early church. In Acts 2.42. Let's look there. Pastor George mentioned this last Sabbath. But it was a condition that existed. Malachi says, those that fear the Lord spoke often one to another. In Acts 2, verse 42, about the time of their Pentecost. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship. They continued in fellowship and in breaking bread and in prayers. Now, brethren, to the best of my knowledge, there's no command in the scripture that we meet only once a week. We're commanded to meet on the Sabbath, obviously. But that's not excluded. We don't Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday are out. There's no command to say that we have to meet just once a week. And I'm glad to say that this little flock isn't meeting just once a week. By making good use of technology, we have a, a weekly prayer meeting, again online. Of course, like everything today, it's not possible because of busy lives for everyone to get there, but the opportunity is there. The door is open for all who can to come and fellowship. Those who spoke often one to another. Why? Because they understand the reverence that we need to have. They're putting it into practice. Iron sharpening iron. Iron sharpening iron, brethren. And, and sometimes at these prayer meetings, we will have a question. And the question will start off here and it will go elsewhere. Because we're going deeper and deeper into it. Nothing rehearsed, nothing scripted. Iron sharpening iron. Again, but as I said earlier, a strong fellowship demands that all the elements of the body are connected. If the eye truly does say to the ear, I have no need of you, we're in trouble. If I was to say to Brother David, I have no need of you, David, we're in, we're in trouble. Mm -hmm. We end up just being a, a cosy social club. Now, I know the face. I know the face. You would have got knocked out a few tunes on the piano. I remember, I remember you. Yeah, I remember you. But I don't actually know you. In fact, in the five years we've been meeting, I haven't said two words to you, apart from can you come and play the piano? That's the danger if we're not connected, brethren. That's that we end up becoming a social club. And again, for emphasis, we all have something to contribute to this body, brethren. We all have something that will bind us together. Your experiences are different to my experiences, but the commonality we have is the Holy Spirit in the Word of God and the application thereof. And far too often, brethren, Biological brothers and sisters fall out. Those who <coughs> once were part of a loving family, they drift apart. And as with most things today, brethren, it's got a label. And it's called dysfunctional. A dysfunctional family, of which, I'm sad to say, 
That term is very familiar to each and every one of us here because we all know someone who all are part of, in one way, shape or form, a dysfunctional family. Let that label not be applied here, brethren, to this body. We are not to be a dysfunctional body or dysfunctional family. As Pastor pointed out again last week, as the church moved away from that first Pentecost, it grew, it flourished, and as we mentioned, certain elements were regularly practiced. Fellowship being one of them. They devoted themselves steadfastly to the Apostles' teaching, which of course, the Apostles' teaching is the Word of God. As taught to them by the Word of God, Jesus Christ himself. So let us, brethren, remind ourselves for this fellowship. Let us remind ourselves part of what the core teaching of Jesus Christ was. Let's turn to Matthew. Matthew 26. So, big, big pardon, Matthew 22. In Matthew 22 and verse 36, Jesus was asked a question. Very familiar set of scriptures here. Master, what is the great commandment in the law? And Jesus said unto him, him being a Pharisee, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it. <coughs> you shall love your neighbour as yourself. On these two commandments, said Jesus, on these two commandments, hang all the law and the prophets. In other words, brethren, loving God in the way that he loves us, loving our neighbour as God would have us love them, was a doctrine that the apostles would have taught. Wherever they went, that would have been a core part of their teachings. Everything, the law and the prophets, has a God they love at its core. And so it is with us, brethren. A God love, mixed with a healthy dose of wisdom, has got to be at the centre of our assembly. Agape love has got to be at the, cent at the centre of this fellowship. Outgoing love, merciful love, sympathetic love, a love that reflects our Father's love for all mankind. It's got to be taught as a slavery within this fellowship. In John 13, 35, we read, By this shall all men know, you are my disciples if you have love one to another. In John 15, verse 12, This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. You love one another as I have loved you, as Jesus Christ loved us, laid down his life for us. We're to live a sacrificial life, brethren, on behalf of each other and our fellow man, because of outgoing love, because of the love that comes from the Holy Spirit that is within us. And John 15, 17 repeats, These things I command you, that you love one another. So brethren, as we learn to bear with and love one another, as this fellowship goes from strength to strength, whilst being under attack from Satan, we must also learn in love to deal with the challenges of an ever-changing world. A strong body, a strong fellowship, a scriptural, doctrinal-based fellowship with Jesus Christ at its heart will be able to meet these challenges. Because brethren, challenges will cross our path. Challenges that if, if they're swept under the carpet, will collect in such a heap that it will block our way on the already narrow path. Hebrews 10, 24 says, Let us consider, let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. Verse 25, 
not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much more the more as you see the day approaching. Got a question for you, brethren. Let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. Is this love and good works to be confined to this body? I think the author of Hebrews is saying here, let's sit down. Let's think how we can encourage each other to be moved into actively stirring each other up to love each other, but by extension, surely our neighbour in an ever increasingly evil world. How do we do that, Brent? How do we stir each other up unto doing good works? And why do we think on that? You could say. And whatever you do, if it is within your power, do not forsake the assembling of yourselves together. I submit, brethren, that we will learn more by being assembled together. We will learn more how to deal with the ever-increasing challenges in love the more we are together. The more one of, or two of us, or three of us, or four of us bring certain elements in of our lives and challenges that we face that are unique to that individual that some of us would never have encountered, how they dealt with it, how they move on, how they show love to another. I think Paul wrote that, brethren, because even back then there was a problem and nothing really changes. You wouldn't have to write that if there was nothing, nothing wrong. Let us consider each other to provoke and stir each other up to good works, not forsaking the assembly of ourselves together. Why would you write that if there wasn't, if everything was hunky-dory? You know, another reason, brethren, why we need to, to be here, as I say, is to learn how to meet scripturally what lies ahead. We need to learn how we're going to meet with these challenges at Bradley. For example, brethren, who knows who's going to walk through that door? Unannounced, unexpected. It's happened. It's happened. And in my time within the Church of God, it's happened on at least three occasions where people have just wandered in. What do we do when those people don't actually look like they should be here? They're certainly not dressed for the occasion, but they wandered in and want some kind of fellowship. Even if it's just basic company. What do we do? We do unto others as we would want them to do unto us. There's that scripture that says, in as much as you did it to them, you did it to me. We show love. We cannot show love if love doesn't exist here. We have to show love. You know, who knows, brethren, if one of you who are being equipped for ministry now through the Word of God, who knows if one of you might not be given the opportunity to have that gift God's given you to be put to use? Who knows who out of you sitting in front of me may just get a random phone call from someone who, through being connected to somebody else, says, oh, they're going to go to church. Yeah, that's, uh, that's Brother So-and-so, Sister So-and-so. You give them a call, they might be able to help you. You haven't got a clue who they are. But they come to you and you realise that they're calling you because they are sincerely reaching out for help. Would you recognise that sincerity? Would you discern that spirit of desperation? Can you detect if someone else is being called? Well, brethren, I submit to you that we give ourselves every opportunity to do so, even if it you know, to, to respond, even if it means to defer to another brother or sister, because of the love that we are seeking to develop here within this fellowship. The word of God, brethren, as you know, is alive, sharper than any two-edged sword. 
and we better make sure we know how to use it. The fruit of a God-centered church, a God-focused church, is that we are driven. We should actively be seeking to be driven by the Holy Spirit to bear fruit that every disciple must be charged with. Love your Lord your God with all your heart, mind and soul and love your neighbour as yourself. That is the core doctrine that should be at the heart of every single disciple. And by being obedient, brethren, to that command, collectively, we preach the gospel. And we do so in ministry by way of evangelism. Individually, you do so in your day-to-day -day lives. Again, by the power of the Holy Spirit, showing love to your fellow man, showing love to your enemies, of which there are many, and of which most don't even realise they are your enemy. Because they are unwittingly enemies of the gospel. And why do they not realise? Because Satan, the God of this world, has been known to deceive and blinded every man from Adam onwards. And coming together, brethren, each and every Sabbath, building strong bonds within the body, within the fellowship, and with God the Father and His Son. This fellowship has been under threat, for want of a better phrase, from day one of creation. Yeah. The seed of doubt was sown. The seed of selfishness was sown. The self-seeking desire of doing your own thing was sown. And it takes us all the way back to Eden. Which leads me on to my last point here, which is the dangers of neglecting fellowship. And of course, brethren, from the beginning, from the beginning, it was God's desire that we fellowship with him. Now, after making us in his image, God interacted and thus fellowshiped with Adam and Eve. In Genesis 1, 28, we read, And God blessed them. And God said unto them, God speaking to them, Be fruitful and multiply. In other words, this is what I want. This is what I would like. Replenish the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. And God said, as he fellowshiped with Adam and Eve, Behold, I have given you every herb bearing seed which is upon the face of the earth, and every tree in which is the fruit of a tree yielding seed. To you it shall be for meat. Verse 30, he says, And to every beast of the earth, and to every fowl of the air, every creeping thing, etc., etc., I have given every green herb for, eat, for, for meat, and it was so. Prior to this in verse 14, we see that God created the seasons. Or the Moedim, which we understand in the Hebrew, translate to appointed times, which we also understand to mean the solemn assemblies. There was a fellowship already. God laid everything out, everything that we needed, everything that our parents needed. Instructions were given and everything was in place for what? for a harmonious life in fellowship with our Creator. In Genesis 2 15, we read, And the Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. And the Lord commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat of it, for in that day you shall surely die. To coin a modern day phrase, brethren, we had one job to do. They had this way to do. Don't, don't press the red button. Whatever you do, don't touch that red button. <coughs> and what do we do? We press the red button. Mm. Don't eat of that fruit. But what do we do? We ate of the fruit. All we had to do was to listen and be obedient to our Father. 
In a nutshell, brethren, does that not show you how strong the carnal mind is? If that doesn't show you how strong the carnal mind is, I don't know what will. Don't touch it. Leave it alone, says your creator. You still can't do it. In fellowship with our creator, brethren, and with people of like mind who have the Father and Son at the centre of their daily lives, who speak often with God, will always be under threat. Fellowship will always be under threat. Satan didn't want Adam and Eve to fellowship with God. He sowed the seed of doubt. The carnal mind took over. And the rest is history, as we know. Our parents rejected fellowship. They neglected the most valuable of the... I mean, you can't get your head around it. I know we can look back in hindsight. And in hindsight's always 2020. But they neglected the most valuable of relationships and thus brought upon each and every one of us divine curses that came just from breaking his law. Women would henceforth deliver in child, give a child in pain. Men would toil and be in competition with thorns and thistles just in order to maintain an existence when we had it all. That is the danger and the consequence of neglecting fellowship with the most supreme being. From that point on it was like God said, okay, you don't, you don't want fellowship with me? Hands off, go your own way. Go your own way. Oh, and by going your own way, the paradise of Eden is yours no more. Yeah. It is yours no more. In Genesis chapter 3, verse 24, he drove out the man. Man was now disfellowshipped. He drove out the man at the east of the Garden of Eden, and he placed cherubim and a flaming sword that turned every way to guard the way of the tree of life. As one man commented recently, and I thought it was a very powerful statement, Shalom was shattered. Shalom was shattered. Three words. Shalom was shattered. Massive consequences for the rest of us. Because they pushed the red button when they were told, don't touch the red button, don't eat of that tree. Shalom was shattered. I think that's a very powerful statement, brethren. Shalom was shattered. And as such, from that point on, we've been groping in the dark, finding our way here, there and everywhere. Some good, some bad. Pretty much hit and miss. And thousands of years on, brethren, Shalom, of course, is still shattered. And as such, because of man neglecting fellowship with his creator, because of that, the church of God will always be continued to meet and be confronted with challenges. That's what I'm trying to get across here. How are we going to meet the challenges that are going to come? Because the world in which we walk and the world in which we are commanded to preach is full of victims, brethren. It's full of victims. Whether it be victims of gambling, drugs, alcohol, victims of sexual abuse, mental abuse, confusion abounds. And mental health issues, brethren, are rampant today, and so on and so forth. The Church of God Brethren today faces challenges that our forefathers could never have imagined. If we are to preach the Gospel unto all the world, then I say, brethren, we need to be prepared. 
prepared for hostility, that's a given. I mean prepared to welcome those who by having their minds open have come to see that in the 21st century they have made the most horrific mistakes. I'm talking about people who have had their minds opened and because of hearing the gospel message they've seen that they've committed the most grievous sins against the flesh and against their fellow men. That's the challenge that we are going to face, brethren, of welcoming people who you think, are you sure? You've had your mind open, are you sure? God can, you might get, a, that's what I'm talking about, you might get that phone call from someone, and the phone call will develop, the conversation will go on, and all of a sudden you realise, hang about, this person has had some serious traumas in their life, and they're, looking, they're reaching out, Yet on the face of it, you wouldn't touch him with a large pole. This is where the discerning spirit comes in again, and loving your neighbour. You love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul, and you love your neighbour, the one made in the image of God, as yourself. The challenges will come, brethren. God has called such people, and God will continue to cause people. And if that raises a few eyebrows, then look no further than Paul. You can say, Paul, okay, so he's a, a main individual in, in, the, in Scripture. But Paul, in real terms, was one who by his own words persecuted the church. The one who was a Pharisee of the Pharisees, who hated the church of God. Brethren, I do not know of one scholar of who would disagree with any of that. Scholars can disagree on certain things, have different opinions. I don't know one scholar who would say, oh, Paul's okay, he didn't really mean it. You know, everyone would agree. Paul hated the church of God with a passion. With a passion. Yet it was Paul, or Saul as we would see, to whom Ananias was sent. And Sister Lola read out, and I'll read it again in Acts chapter 9. There was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias. And the Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias, and he said, Behold, I am here, Lord. The Lord said to him, Arise and go into the street which is called Straight. Inquire in the house of Judas for one called Saul, Saul of Tarsus. Because he, behold, he's praying. And has seen in a vision a man, so Saul has seen in a vision, a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him that he might receive his sight. Ananias answered and said, Lord, I have heard by many of this man how much evil he has done to, to your saints at Jerusalem. And he actually got authority from the chief priests to bind all that called on your name. But the Lord said, go your way. For he, can you get your head around this, brethren? For he is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. Go your way, Ananias. Go your way, you who say you have fellowship with me. Go your way who say that you love me and you love your neighbour as yourself. Go your way and welcome and greet the one that I am calling. And not only that, go your way and greet the one who will eventually be the leader of the Church of God. Whether he be an accomplice or not to murder, go your way. Can you imagine if that was to happen to happen here today? Because we either believe that happened or we or it should stop. Paul hated the church. We know his story. Hang on, I'll hold your coat while you stand Stephen. An accomplice to murder. On and on and on 
His reputation went before, I think he says in Galatians, that his reputation went before him. That how he persecuted the church of God. There was nothing good about this man's legacy in the eyes of the church of God. And in principle, brethren, a similar challenge awaits us today. And we need to be prepared and accept, like Ananias, that God calls who he wills. God calls who he wants. And what better way, brethren, to be prepared for the challenge than by fellowship? Not as a social club, but being equipped through the word of God with like-minded brethren. Christ came to restore the shattered peace. Christ came to restore shattered peace and therefore by extension he came to restore fellowship. Again, let us not forsake the assembling of ourselves together. We cannot return to Eden, brethren, in this life. But we can by the Holy Spirit we can create a type of Eden where we come before God each Sabbath. We can create that environment for the Holy Spirit. We can create a type of Eden for those who are being called now and who crave fellowship with people of like mind. We can create an Eden for those who at this point in time are where we once were. And where have we come from? Simply put, the wilderness, brethren. That's where we've all come from. And in the dark. And being in the wilderness and being in the dark is not a nice place to be. <clears throat> but think on, brethren. Being both back in the wilderness and being back in the dark is where Satan wants to drive you back to. He doesn't want you to have any connection to Eden at all. And it's, it's where we may end up if we neglect fellowship with each other and of course God the Father. Again, coming back to Christ, God the Father being this, at the centre of this fellowship. If it's not at the centre of our weekly fellowship, our daily fellowship within the, the friendships that we build within the Church of God, if it's not at the centre, we are in danger of walking away we place ourselves at, at that risk. You cannot fellowship in the dark, brethren. In First John chapter one verse six, we read, "If we claim to have, if we claim, we have a lovely fellowship. We are fellowshipping with God the Father and Jesus Christ." First John says, "If we claim to have fellowship with Him, while we are walking in the darkness." We are lying and we're not living out the truth. God will not be mocked. This cannot be a social club. We're church of God on the door and come in and it's anything but the church of God. It's got to be at this. God has got, the word of God has got to be at this. Of course we have conversations that are just almost small talk at times, but we always come back to being a God-centred flock. A God-centred flock with the Word of God at its epicentre. So brethren, as I come to a close here, let us not take this fellowship for granted. Let us not take this body for granted. You know, as I said at the beginning, I've kind of approached this subject from maybe a different angle than normal. But overall, I want us to have come away thinking that we should be embracing the fellowship. Understand, brethren, that you have a part to play in the body. Where you've been placed. You have been placed in the body for the benefit of others. And through fellowship, brethren, seek to be equipped. Seek to be equipped for your part in ministering to the person who you might get a phone call this week to the person who you might bump into in the street, to the person who might walk through that door any second now. Be equipped to minister to them. Christ said, let them be one. 
as we are one. Let them be one. Let us be one. As Jesus Christ and his Father are one. Psalm 133 verse 1 says, Behold, how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. Fellowship lifts the spirit. Amen. Let us be unified through the word of God. A unity of fellowship is what we need if we are to preach the gospel effectively. Again, unity of fellowship with godly love and wisdom at the centre has got to be in place if we are to welcome victims of a sick world that just may come through that door. Yes. Be mindful, brethren, that as God wanted fellowship with Adam and Eve, he certainly wants it with you. Don't neglect it. Don't neglect it. Jesus Christ, our elder brother, died in order that we could have fellowship. So in a sense, fellowship, this fellowship is priceless. So brethren, I pray, I truly pray, that we see more the value of fellowship. And let us hold on to that, brethren, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Pastor Gary for the uh, main message. We uh, have a final two hymns now and an opportunity to sing praise to our God. So we've got to take the hymnal, go to page 58 or hymn number 58 in the garden and when you found that if you can rise with us. 58 in the garden.
for our final hymn is not in the hymnal. So you will find a sheet like this on the chair next to you. It's called By This Shall All Men Know. The Marta Lot called Pastor Runcam for closing the prayer. <laughs> Our hearts are inclined 
more towards the selfish things. And we thank you for the reminder in this sermon today. That's a very graphic reminder in the scriptures of the human body which represents is a symbolic of the church with so many parts to it yet each is essential each has a role to play none can substitute the role of the other yet father even though we have this this is who we are this is all what our body is made of yet it becomes difficult for us to fall in your command to love one another and to fellowship. We pray, O oh God, that today may be a day that we rethink and we reflect and we will apply these words to our lives individually. We pray that it may not just be in theory, but practically we can see ourselves demonstrating this fellowship among one another. We know, oh God, you've said that by this mention, no, you are my disciples, if you love one another. And we know there are many who are looking on. There are many who will come to visit and to be among us. But sometimes it's not the doctrines. It is not our eloquence. It is not the beauty of the surroundings in which we are. It is the love and the fellowship that we have with one another. We pray that your Spirit, O oh God, will dwell with us and remind us, touch our minds and our hearts, and stir us up, O oh God, that we may truly come to the full realization and practice of this command. We thank you for the Sabbath day. We thank you for the fellowship that will follow. We thank you for the meal that has been provided. We pray, O oh God, that your spirit may truly dwell with us and give us the hearts and minds like that of Jesus Christ, our Lord, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Okay, brethren, so we'll be having fellowship. What time are we going to come back online for Zoom? About four o'clock? It's not three. Sorry, what's the time then? It's coming up to stream. Yeah, at about, at about a quarter to four. Four, okay. Quarter to four. Really with that? Four or three four. Okay, for, for people online, we are going to have a Zoom meeting at 4 p.m. Uh, if you'd like to join us, I will read the same login details on Telegram. Thanks for joining us. No, 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 no,